Hey there, you are listening to Red Menace Podcast. My name is Allison, and I'm here with my co-host, Brett, and we are doing another episode where we're going to be talking about current events. For those who are unfamiliar with our show, uh, we kind of alternate every other month. We will do one month of tackling theory, so some sort of theoretical text, trying to break it down and show how it applies to organizing today, and then uh, the next month we'll usually do current events. We are on two back-to-back current event months right now because there was an election in the United States. States, and that gives us uh, quite a bit to talk about actually going forward. So we've decided to do two back-to-back. We'll be getting back to theoretical stuff soon, so don't worry about that. We just want to make sure that we were able to sort of tackle what's going on. You can find us online at Twitter at red underscore menace underscore pod or at Patreon at patreon.com slash the red menace. We have special content available for patrons. Usually it's an additional monthly episode. Sometimes it's something that's kind of complementary to what we've discussed in our main episodes. Frequently it's it's Q&A with patrons. It just kind of varies depending on the month. So if you're interested in that, you should definitely check us out on there. We appreciate all the support we can get. But yeah, so jumping into this month, obviously, uh, there's a lot going on. We did our last current events episode right before the election happened, and now we are on the other side of this election. And uh, things are, you know, in an interesting place. We have a Biden victory and varying levels of Trump contesting things. And, you know, we're just going to go ahead and get sort of right into what's going on in the world around us and how we can sort of understand that through a Marxist lens and be able to use that understanding in order to try to make this world a better place. So, Brett, do you want to go ahead and start us off then? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we'll get to the election in in a second, and it certainly was crazy in certain ways, but not as crazy as it could have been in other ways. Uh, One of the things that I think we were really anticipating the possibility of in our last episode, I think everybody just generally also was like, is there going to be a lot of violence? And and for whatever reason, there still has definitely been violence. There was huge clashes with the Proud Boys right around the election and stuff like that. There's been a lot of stop the steal sort of protesting, um, individual scuffles and individual protest events. Um, Nothing that we haven't seen all summer, really. Um, But not a lot, at least yet, of like armed or any sort of organized violence um, to speak of. But we'll get into that and the implications of of everything throughout this conversation. But the way I kind of wanted to start it today was – to focus in on actually two things that happened to me personally this week um, because they are sort of microcosms of broader trends happening in, in our society at large. So the first thing that, that happened this week was that a, a close friend of mine was basically because of COVID, they had recently lost their job. They're a cook at a at a like a restaurant, like an IHOP style restaurant uh, here here in Omaha, and they got COVID while they were on the job. They had already lost their car, right? So they were getting rides home from people. One of the one of the coworkers that he got a ride home from had COVID, didn't know it was asymptomatic, spread it on the way home. He he quickly came down with a pretty severe case of of COVID. Um, could not work, right? His his job said you can come back when you have a negative test from a, a doctor. Um, and that's going to be a, a couple weeks at, in the earliest. Um, so he, you know, living paycheck to paycheck like most working people do, wasn't able to make his rent payment. His landlord immediately took him to eviction court. He tried to appeal to the CDC moratorium on evictions for whatever reason that was uh, that was rejected by the judge. I don't exactly know why. Something to do with the we live in a deep red state. Our governors can choose to advance certain protections or, or not enforce them. And I think that's part of the reason uh, why this happened. I have friends in tenant rights organizations that have said they've successfully here in Omaha used that CDC declaration to prevent an eviction. But in any case, by the time it got to, to me that he was in deep trouble, he was already kicked out of his house. Um, and his landlord was saying, if you don't get somebody over here in the next day to help you move all this shit, you know, we're going to throw it all away. Uh, he has very little possessions to begin with. I have a truck. Um, I immediately went over there and helped him do that. Um, we set him up in a hotel just out of our own, our own pockets, which, you know, ultimately comes from our Patreon supporters. So anybody on this Patreon or Rev Left's Patreon, you literally helped prevent somebody from becoming homeless this month. So thank you so much for that. Um, so we were able to get him into that and then we set up a GoFundMe quickly, got some really nice donations from just some amazing strangers, people we don't even know, hundreds of dollars at a time donations. And we were able to, um, rake in about 2000. Um, so anyways, we were able to prevent him from becoming acutely homeless in that moment. Um, but we're still trying to find him a place to, to be. And of course, when you have an eviction on your record, Landlords can choose to be very picky about that and, and reject it. Um, 
And, and this, this again is, is a personal situation I'm dealing with, but what does it point to? It points to these broader trends in our society regarding the, the, the pandemic and the subsequent economic crisis, how acute it is for people on the lower mm-hmm. ends of the working class. When you have this downward movement, small businesses shut down, they get put thrown back into the working class. The people at the bottom of the working class then have to contend openly with peer homelessness and eviction and, and these sorts of things. And that's where he was pushed him over the edge. He doesn't have family. His mom died a few years ago. His, his step family cut him off from any, you know, tiny inheritance he might have gotten and skipped town. So this is somebody with no family network to lean on, no, no mother or father's house to stay at. And so we were literally the, the only thing standing between him and, and homelessness. Um, and so this is an ongoing process, but this is happening to millions and millions of people. And if it's not directly happening to them, it's hanging over their head, could happen to them at any moment. In the midst of this, in the midst of, of organ, of organizing this, this fundraiser, uh, going out with him to, to get a car, trying to get the stuff out of his house so it doesn't get thrown away, whatever little stuff he does have, most of which is like some memorabilia of his like family, like pictures of his mom and stuff that they were threatening to throw away if he didn't, you know, get them out in a certain amount of time, which is just, you know, horrific. But as this is all happening, all of a sudden I get doxxed again. Uh, this kind of came out of nowhere. I, I was like in day two of trying to help my friend. Very stressful, you know, trying to make sure that, that he doesn't dive into to homelessness. And then I get the alert that another flyer campaign all around Omaha has been has been had and it was uh it was a uh, you know like the the flyer said something like anti white antifa once you gone be aware and stay safe and then it had a bunch of people's names and addresses um right underneath it including mine and it was a lot of random fucking people um <laughs> random in the sense that I'm not even engaged in any sort of of activism on that front with a, with a pregnant fiance and stuff for years now. I've stepped away from direct engagement on, on that stuff and just try to focus on political education and mutual aid. But still, I got caught up in it. Um, and, you know, that's incredibly stressful. The the organization that, that did this docs, they're, they're called the White Rangers. <laughs> And, uh, just the, just the, the douchiest, uh, sort of, sort of name you could come up with. And they managed to get my address wrong. So once again, the neo Nazis proving that they are neither smart nor cool. Um, <laughs> uh, just, I just love the idea of, of naming your, your neo Nazi fascist organization after one of the Power Rangers. But that's what we have on our hands. And in any case, it's just, it's just another layer of stress. And that ties in with the, you know, the uprising, the insurgence of fascism. And, you know, how will it morph and change under a Biden administration compared to a Trump one, which is maybe something we can, we can touch on. And then just zooming out a little bit. That's my personal life, but zooming out a little bit to Omaha this week. Two things happened, which again point to big trends in our society. The Omaha Police Department killed a, a 30 year old, I believe he's 30, 31 year old black man by the name of Kenneth Jones. Uh, he, he was in a car with four other people and, um, you know, it's really happening right now. Protests are erupting. I don't have a lot of the, the details on exactly how that's going. The people in the street are trying to get them to release the, the footage to see exactly how the, how the killing went down. But on the day after that happened, there was a mass shooting here in Omaha. It was a, it was more confined. It was in the southern sort of metro area in, in a place called Bellevue. It's like attached to Omaha. It's the same thing. Um, but it was at a Sonic and, and just some, some asshole came and started spraying people. And uh, apparently he had been at a, he had stole a Sonic app card previously that week and, and, and basically stole $57 worth of Sonic food, got arrested for that, got bailed out, went back to the Sonic and just started shooting people. And in his mug shot, he has a, he has a huge smile on his face. One of the people killed was a friend of a friend's roommate. So we're like two degrees separated from a, a family now, or, you know, um, somebody trying to figure out how they're going to pay rent with their roommate just being slaughtered from a mass shooting. So, you know, here in Omaha and here in my personal life, all of these things have come to a sort of crossroads and, and hit all at the same time. And this is a community that, that continues to sort of reel in the face of, of, of stuff like OPD killings. You know, earlier we've talked about the, the murder of James Skurlock and the subsequent suicide of the white supremacist business owner who did it. Um, so this is a community that, that's hurting and this just adds to the hurt. So that's kind of where I am right now. And, and that's what's going on in my life and in my community. Allison, do you have any updates on, on what exactly is going on to, in, in your community? Anything happening or do you just want to move on to, to other topics to cover? 
Yeah, so, I mean, nothing has been quite so acute here. Um, you know, LA is in a weird place at the moment. Um, we're, like, going way, way back into shutdown at the moment. Outdoor dining is getting closed down again. Things are shutting down. But one thing that I find really disturbing, I kind of follow, like, a lot of the online discussions of community members in LA, both on, like, Reddit and the Citizen app. And, you know, I'm personally actually very concerned about the way that a lot of people are responding to the pandemic in terms of really concerned conservative and reactionary attitudes starting to like really uh, become more dominant here. So the pandemic here, you know, has obviously had the same economic effects that it's had everywhere. And LA already has a huge homelessness problem. Um, Our rent is ridiculously high. Santa Monica is now in like the top five highest zip codes in the country. Um, It is just an impossible place to afford to live. And already we've had a huge amount of homelessness. And now as the pandemic has really been pushing things uh, more in a economically disastrous direction, more people are facing homelessness as a result of that. And there has just been such a fucking horrible reactionary backlash to that, that I've been seeing in basically all the discussion forums for LA as a city where people are angry about homelessness, not in terms of what produces homelessness or the failed economy, but the way that homelessness inconveniences them. Uh, and, you know, I'm seeing, like, a lot of calls for criminalization and for, you know, pushing the police to enforce petty theft laws more thoroughly and these other things so that they can get homeless people into jail instead of on the street. And so, you know, part of what I'm seeing here, at least in terms of what's going on with the pandemic at the moment, seems to be, like, a really reactionary turn that I find really concerning in a place Place that is generally known for having more liberal left, uh, in quotation marks, views, that people are kind of responding, not in terms of solidarity with uh, others, but in terms of increased isolation and atomization. Uh, and I think it's really unfortunate. And, you know, it's uh, not surprising capitalist ideology teaches us to think that way, but that's been a really unfortunate thing to see here. Uh, the other side of that, right, is that organizing continues to be done by radical groups here who are taking care of unhoused people, who are taking care of those who have needs in the city that aren't being met. But, you know, seeing the general tide move in that more reactionary direction, I think, is really unfortunate. The other thing I wanted to touch on, um, because you sort of brought up both of these issues, Brett, is the issue of police killing and the issue of um mass shootings, and both of these things are things that have not slowed down uh, as we're moving into the winter, right? You know, there are still continued police shootings even after a summer of fairly militant and intense protests, and mass shootings have been continuing on a steady level, and it is always sort of the thing where as much as a crisis like this pandemic kind of disrupts and interrupts everything, the worst sort of parts of capitalist society are the parts that seem to be still going at a really steady pace, which is unfortunate and I think really drives home just how broken things are at this point, where people's lives are super disrupted, but the worst forms of violence uh, seem to be continuing mostly unabated, even with resistance that happened in the summer to police shootings in particular. So, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, not a hopeful time to be in, I think. But hopefully, you know, by analyzing some things today, we can try to figure out what can be done about things. Yeah, and, and as usual, you know, fear is, is, a, is a deep motivating emotion mm-hmm. in the psyche of reaction. Um, it, it sees a, a spreading homelessness crisis. It sees that whatever their situation could even be under pressure or could continue to be in worse situations as, as this goes on. And instead of uniting and showing solidarity with people, it's you're fighting for your shitty position on an already right. broken hierarchical ladder. Um, in Texas this week, the, the food lines were, were unprecedented, backed up for miles. People waited hours and hours and hours just for some basic um, food for their families. And, uh, you know, once again, we see uh, just no federal leadership, no federal guidance, no s- second stimulus. Uh, is that even on the, on the horizon? I don't know. I mean, we can get into this a little bit when we talk about the Biden administration, but you have a Biden administration that wants to do something on the pandemic. But if you lose those two Georgia Senate seats or even one of them, you don't get a majority in the Senate. Mitch McConnell already proved for eight years under Obama exactly what he's going to do, which is obstruct, prevent, obstruct, prevent anything and everything. And then when anything goes to the Supreme Court, you now have a conservative majority Supreme Court that will side with the right in most cases. So it's a very terrible situation in so many ways. It's a failed state, at least for the poor and the working class. Yeah. Uh, for the rich, for international corporations, 
it, the state still functions just fine for for imperialism, for military industrial complex. The U.S. state is doing everything it's it's always done for them. But for regular people on the ground, it's leaving us to the wolves. And instead of society coming together to help each other, we turn on one another. Um, we we we're pitted against each other in an even more desperate rat race than normal capitalism, you know, in its normal functioning. And and it's really horrifying, and it, and it calls for. For solidarity, but in a lot of ways, I mean, this is just a monumental time of spiritual emptiness and, and moral decline and, mm-hmm. and, and visionlessness and no political imagination and no direction. Um, and as, as Biden's win is nothing but a bandaid on, on a severely broken leg. It's, 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 um, a false hope for, for only the naive to indulge in. Um, so that's where we're at as a society. Yeah. It's rough. Um, you want to go ahead and jump into you talking about the elections and what happened there? Yeah, yeah, sure. And go ahead and start us off on that. Cool. So, uh, let me start by recapping things a little bit. Uh, so our discussion of the election ahead of times and then what has ended up happening. So if you've been listening to our show recently, obviously, uh, we've tried to wrestle with possible outcomes of the election as a lot of people have, right? Even sort of liberals, uh, this time around, we're very interested in what could go wrong with this election and trying to game out possible outcomes. So we, uh, really listed out several possible outcomes for what we thought were, you know, could come out of the election. Uh, and what we sort of ended up with, uh, has been a mixture of things. So to sort of recap how the election has gone, if you weren't paying attention, um, you know, the original prediction for a lot of the more mainstream polls people was that there would be a Biden win, but that it would not look like a Biden win on election night. And that prediction with the details not quite going how they thought it would seems to more or less have played out. So on election night at first, um, you know, it really looked like a Trump victory, but a lot of that had to do with a lot of the strange situations involved in this election and the time at which late mail-in ballots got counted. So even on, you know, election night, while it looked like Trump had probably won several of the states with states like Georgia and Wisconsin reporting at 99% and looking red, it was a, you know, situation where that 1% actually that was uncounted was enough to flip them blue. So, you know, as we went into a couple days after the election, those late ballots got counted and uh, several states flipped blue, pointing to a Biden win. And as basically everyone predicted, uh, Trump has uh, refused to officially concede in any way. So early on, this looked like mostly throwing a fit on Twitter once the election was called for Biden, and there have been a host of legal challenges. So the main form of opposition that uh, Trump seems to be putting forward is in the court system, but those have mostly been failing and been getting thrown out. They're mostly focused on technicalities, like how close polls poll watchers were allowed to stand at the table where ballots were getting counted, um, or last minute rules that county election boards had made. And so most of these are not going in Trump's favor. Um, at this point, it is pretty clear that Biden has won and that there will be a transition to Biden. Uh, at the point that this last week, Georgia, uh, really, and Pennsylvania both confirmed their recounts, stating that it was a Biden victory. That pretty much closes the door for Trump on even most of those legal challenges to really have any path to contest this. Uh, Trump has, you know, tweeted out probably the closest thing we're going to get to a concession speech from him, which is basically saying that the transition can move forward and that he would like Republicans to stop sending death threats to the White House person who is overseeing the transition. Uh, So that tells you something about how their side is doing right now. So we are looking, of course, then at this Biden victory and a delayed but now seemingly moving forward transition to a Biden presidency. So a couple things that I want us to think about here, and I, even some self-critical reflection. This election has been, you know, relatively eventful in as much as it's a contested election, and those are often eventful. But a lot of the more catastrophic predictions that were made about this election really haven't played out, right? So I've tried to be fairly sober-minded uh, in my perspective. And my you know, thought for this election is that it will be a continual uh, erosion of liberal norms, which is inevitable as capitalism moves into crisis, and probably will keep moving us towards further balkanization as a country. Um, but at the same time, you know, we thought that we would be seeing more uh, right-wing violence than we are seeing at the moment. There has been some violence, uh, like Brett mentioned, at the Million MAGA March or whatever, there were some fights that broke out, some people got stabbed, so there has been violence, but it hasn't been exceptionally more intense than I I think we've been seeing over the last few months anyway. 
Now, maybe that's because, you know, at the time that that, mar that march happened, it's still, there was hope in Trump people's heart that these legal challenges could win, and only now are we really looking at, for sure, there's just no way Trump is going to pull this off, so that could still be coming, but it's fairly hard to say. The other thing is that on the more of, like, catastrophic end of predictions. There were a lot of people, including both liberals and leftists, that were predicting that Trump would stage some sort of coup in this moment, or that this would ignite some sort of civil war, and we've certainly fallen very, very short of those situations. Um, you know, the coup stuff in particular largely had to do with Trump last second after the election replacing a bunch of the heads of the Pentagon, but what seems to mostly be happening there at this point is that he did that in order to make a bunch of last-minute moves to pull troops out of places and scale down U.S. involvement in places in a way that seems to basically be to spite the more war hockey liberals who are coming in under Biden. So even that hasn't really played out, and we are not in a state of civil war. We are probably closer to it than we were before the election, but we are not in that situation right now. So, you know, a lot of these predictions ended up not being uh, super correct. So there's kind of a question that I want us to think through a little bit, which is like, why were people, including to some degree us, based on what things are currently looking like, wrong uh, on this? And what does that mean? So there's kind of uh, two ideas that I want to throw out there that I think can be useful and maybe potentially useful in a self-critical manner as well. And one is that I think some people, myself included, probably allowed ourselves to get pulled into somewhat of a liberal framing of things, of Trump as this uniquely abhorrent break from the current system and, uh, you know, a unique threat. And while I do think Trump is, you know, more likely to create instability than someone like Biden. At the same time, Trump is also just a symptom of the same American system that Biden is. And a lot of the attempts to paint Trump as, like, exceptionally fascist in some way were kind of used to make people more excited for Biden, I think, and to make this appeal that Biden had to be voted in. So, you know, possibly falling prey to some of that liberal framing, I think, is something that happened to the left, including myself a little bit, that might have caused uh, some failed predictions about how bad things would go in this situation. And the other thing is sort of just the general trend of catastrophism. Uh, I think the left is prone to catastrophism in a lot of ways when trying to predict the future, largely because the story of the left in the United States is one of losing mm -hmm. um, and of getting crushed in a lot of instances. And so I think there's a lot of banking on worst possible situations, maybe, in order to... Um, you know, prepare for things to go badly. And in this instance, things did not play out in the most horrific ways that they could have played out. Although, again, we'll see what the long-term effects of this are going forward. So those are sort of two things I think might be at play there. But I'm interested in what you think, Brett, about why this has gone um, somewhat less dramatically than a lot of people have predicted. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. There could be a number of explanations. One, I think, is the sort of incompetence of, of Trump, the lack of ideology, the lack of self-discipline to be able to coordinate or organize anything mm -hmm. even slightly effective. Um, what it does show, and I think there is some merit to this, is that if it was a much closer sort of election, something more akin to what we saw in 2000 with Bush v. Gore when it came down to literally a couple hundred or a couple thousand votes in one state – um, it, we now know for a fact that the Republican elite and the Republican politicians and talking head would absolutely go along with it. And I think there's something to point out here, too, which is re relevant and, and I think important, at least noteworthy, which is that don't think for a fucking second that the GOP elites – the, the McConnells of the world believed that the vote was stolen, right? right? None of the people, even the people parroting the lie, nursing Trump's ego, perpetuating this fucking embarrassing um, act of just, you know, decaying the institutions you pretend to care about so much. Um, you know, what's behind it all is cynicism. They, they know that their base is, is, off in La La Land, they're conspiratorial by nature. I mean, these are people that feed them stuff like climate change denialism for years, um, anti-science, anti-intellectualism, and you wonder, you know, you look at the beast that you've created and you just shake your head like, oh shit, how are we going to wrangle this thing into control now? Um, so there's a lot, so there's a lack of competence. Um, the, the, the victory overall was larger than they would have liked it to be until they couldn't really play around at the margins effectively. Um, and, and I think the liberal media, 
did a fair job before the election at just laying out that there was going to be this red mirage and this blue shift. Mm -hmm. So most people that were connected to reality, at least, knew that this was a real possibility. And when it started happening, it was like, oh, okay, this is happening. It's not this big thing. Um, and, And you can even see now really ruptures on the right coming out of this where, you know, the elites know that it's fake, but they played into it for too long. Um, the base is actually fully convinced, right? The, 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 the yeah. base – I heard somebody on Rush Limbaugh listen to the right wing sometimes. A, a caller calls into Rush Limbaugh and it's like you know this middle-aged guy and he's talking about going to the MAGA rallies. He starts weeping on his call with Rush because he's like, I know they took it from us and only you and Trump are the only people that stand up for us. you know. And he starts crying on, on um, live call. And that speaks to the fact that the base – at least a huge percentage of them really think some shit went down. And and what this means going forward is that a significant portion of the Republican base will just no longer accept the results of elections as legitimate. That you already saw a little bit of that with um with Obama and birtherism and and these attempts to invalidate the Democratic president um, around racial lines. You know, Trump rose to political prominence on this birther conspiracy where him and Rudy Giuliani were running around trying to find proof, and we see that exact pattern still pathetically playing out Um, but but now it's really been deepened and more and more people are just not even looking at the system as legitimate anymore for the all the wrong reasons right of course the system's not legitimate but it's not it's not illegitimate for the reasons that the hardcore trump base thinks Um, and and so now that the gap between how they perceive the world and the actual world continues to get wider and wider. We see conspiracy theories coming to, to fill that gap, and maybe we can we can touch on that a little bit. But another reason I think um, why that why we were prone to this catastrophic thinking, I think you touched on a lot of them, but also, and this is something we've touched on in the past. There's something that's like more hopeful about some big rupture, like whether it's a right. civil war or a revolution or some singular big event that can radically change things. There's some hope for something like that because we know that we can't continue limping on for very long with this broken system. Like things are going to be worse if we try to, you know, elongate the lifespan of the system. But you know, what we talked about last time is what we're probably in for is not some glorious ruptural event, whether a civil war or a revolution or anything in between, but for a sad and slow and rotting decay, which can take years, decades, or even generations. And I don't know exactly how that will go. And we do have some constraints with, with climate change and people waking up to the urgency of that, that could, you know, not allow this to go out for multiple generations. Um, but I, I think there's something in, in the human psyche that would prefer even a, a terrible, monstrous event over a slow and steady decline into chaos and a failed state status. And I think we're more and more looking at that as the actual trajectory that, that we're on. Not to say there won't be moments of incredible violence, not to say that there won't be things, something like um, a civil war, you know, fighting in the streets. We already see elements of what a civil war is composed of. We see the shattered epistemologies and people having totally different conceptions of the world, which also foment this deep division that is not getting any better going forward. So there are hints at that, but it's not going to be a big event like that. And it's not going to be a situation like, like a lot of people thought where, you know, Trump successfully uh, pulls off a coup. And the reason why, another reason why that's not going to happen is because elements within the ruling class no longer like Trump. He doesn't serve their interest. The GOP wrangled out of Trump what they could get out of him, right? They got their justices on the court. They got their huge tax cuts. He's really disposable for the Mm -hmm. overall Republican and right-wing movement. You could just enter in somebody that's more competent and continue getting out of it what they want out of it. So they don't really need Trump, but they need his base. And that puts them in this weird position where they have to placate this increasingly conspiracy brained base to bring them along with the Republican efforts to win power. Um, but the base is becoming less and less trusting of the Republican establishment because they see them as throwing Trump to the wolves and not properly defending um, him against this, this stolen election. So these divisions on the right make the right less stable, but also make it more dangerous. Um, people that really think that really think they believe in liberty and freedom and democracy and they supported Trump and really thought it was stolen. Well, that 
takes away the excuse that they have to abide by democratic norms and they can turn to things like militia violence and whatnot. So we'll see how these things develop. But yeah, Tucker Carlson coming out this week and trying to talk the, the Trump base off the ledge, right? Like actually there's no evidence. Um, Sidney Powell did not give us evidence and sort of like attacked her. And then on Twitter, the Trump base is like, you know, fuck Tucker Carlson. He's no longer our friend. He's, he's part of the QAnon deep state or whatever the hell. Um, so these, yeah, these, these cleavages on the right are interesting. And I think that's part of the reason, along with everything else that Allison and I said before that resulted in this not being successful. And then of course it poses the question, what exactly is a coup, right? If, if, <laughs> if Trump was going to do something like a successful coup, what would it actually entail? Um, maybe that's not a question we need to dive into in, in this moment, but just rejecting the results with no evidence obviously isn't, isn't the path to that. It would, it would need to be much more coordinated, much more organized. You'd need elements of the intelligence agencies and the military to back you up, et cetera, and Trump just doesn't have it. Yeah. No, and I think the fracturing is particularly interesting, right? Because one thing that we talked about is like, where does the GOP go from here? in our previous episode. And like, that is, I think the question. Um, so I think I've shouted them out before, but a podcast that I really like, uh, is knowledge fight. So they listen to Alex Jones and kind of break down the important stuff. And Alex Jones is someone who I think, uh, increasingly does not have that much influence, but he's really pairing up with someone who I think does have influence, who I think is a really scary motherfucker, which is Nick Fuentes, Mm. um, who, you know, represents kind of more openly fascist than Alex, um, kind of Catholic reactionary stuff. Uh, you know, the Groiper crew is kind of his whole thing. Um, and they had a rally together in uh, Atlanta, and what you know, Nick was focusing on very much, and that Alex kind of was focusing on, was saying, our enemy is the GOP. Mm-hmm. Um, and really saying, like, what we need now is to turn on the Republican Party, because it has failed us. So they're pointing to how many of these Republicans right now are now saying, okay, Trump lost, like, we need to move on, and sensing that as a really real betrayal. And, you know, that does further those sort of conspiratorial side of things. And I think even, you know, we'll probably see Alex Jones getting more popular again now that he gets to frame himself kind of as this opposition figure, mm-hmm. right? Because part of the thing that was weird about the conspiracy theorists right now is that their guy was in fucking power. So it's kind of weird to be like the anti-establishment conspiracy theorist and defending the president. Yeah. Uh, but now they obviously are out of power, which gives them sort of that positioning that they need to actually, again, look a little more countercultural, perhaps, and to appeal to more people in a way that I think could be really, really dangerous. So is that going to create a serious fracture in the GOP? It's kind of hard to say, but it is becoming clear that a lot of the power players in the GOP, like you said, they know they don't need Trump. They don't owe him shit. And they are very willing to jump ship as, you know, each day passes. And what that's going to do for the more far right elements, I think, is uh, really, really concerning. So we'll have to keep an eye on that, obviously. But what form things will take is going to be uh, interesting going forward. Yeah, and one more thing, uh, just just mm-hmm. to mention it, uh, the business elite, right? Thinking about like what is like the the big capitalist ruling class preference, it would be something like a Biden presidency with a Republican Senate, because gridlock, obstructionism, the inability to solve any of our problems only benefits multinational corporations because it means less regulation, less restraint. You know, Trump gave them the tax cuts that they've always wanted, like Bush did before him. And so they're fine with with gridlock and stalemate. And they're certainly fine um, with a an, um, an American working class or a mass population pitted against each other in a million different ways. Uh, that serves their interest. So we saw the, the, the stock market rally, um, you know, in, in the wake of what amounts to the closest thing from a concession speech we'll get from, uh, from Trump. And that really indicates that for that element of American society, they're fine with the way things are right now. And of course they think very short term because that's how the, the capitalist, you know, logic of like short term profit over everything else dictates they think. So we'll see how these things play out long term. But I just wanted to mention that. And the second thing is that all of this gestures towards the fact that um, you know, contrary to, to some naive assumptions that we have a, a unified ruling class, um, there's a deep multiple fractures all among the ruling class. And there are elements within the ruling class jostling for control and power and, and, you know, the steering wheel of empire. And so we don't have a, a competent, 
a ruling class. We don't have some conspiratorial elite in smoke-filled rooms. We have a really fractured, deeply incompetent, visionless um, ruling class, which is wrestling amongst themselves. And uh, what this whole pandemic has taught us, what this election has taught us, what all these politicians continue to teach us is that these fucking people don't deserve to govern us. They don't have any legitimacy in the eyes of an increasing amount of people, and that's precisely because of their utter failures. You know, they can keep this thing together if they just govern well. <laughs> they can extend the life lifespan of their system if they just govern competently and make sure that people get fucking stimulus checks during a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic and global recession, but they can't even do that. And so those fractures in the ruling class are at least something to monitor and be aware of, and they manifest in electoral politics, so we we pay attention to it because we want to understand the machinations and fractures of the ruling class as Marxists who are invested in building a totally different world. Um, so we have to pay attention to these things. We have to struggle to understand them so that we can have some broader and better and more sharp analysis than any of our contenders or enemies do. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, the other thing to consider, too, is just that, you know, it is not only the big bourgeoisie who drives politics. I think I have hinted at this before, but one of the things that's really helped me understand some of these contradictions is understanding a lot of Trump's base as petty bourgeoisie in particular, right? It's a lot of these small business owners, a lot of these tradespeople who've moved into a petty bourgeoisie position, whereas the people who support neoliberals like Biden are, by and large, like the big bourgeoisie who have much more interest in kind of that financial stability than the smaller capitalists who are willing to kind of risk the instability that a sort of Trump populist reaction looks like because it doesn't hurt them in the same way. So there are these multiple uh, sort of strata as well that I think are relevant there. So it's not just strictly like ruling class infighting, but infighting between subdivisions within the capitalist class as well that can help us sort of see what's at play there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I always say this because it's just a, a, a good reference point. But when you see these far right wing rallies like these Trump supporters and stuff, you right. often <laughs> see them in 2019 Dodge trucks with extended cabs or like, you know, Trump's beautiful boaters like who can afford a boat? You know, who can afford a big right. boat and 1700 <laughs> Trump flags to fly behind it? That that indicates a certain class strata that makes up the core of that reactionary element. And then Republican people like Josh Howley and these other conservatives that, that want to frame themselves as the GOP is the new class of uh, the new party of the working class. They're actually really talking about this sort of labor aristocracy and petty bourgeois strata. They're not talking about the multiracial, you know, service industry working class. And so even though they, they say that in a way that even sort of obscures it to themselves, it's, it's important to know which elements of the quote unquote working class, which is already an obscured term in American politics that they're referencing. And it's this upper echelon where the, the upper echelon of the labor aristocracy meets with the petty bourgeois strata. That's what they're going after. And they're calling that winning over the ruling class. So just something to be aware of. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely. So do we want to switch to thinking about Biden and COVID? Because that's sure. the other big yeah. thing right now and what's going on. Um, so yeah, you know, this is another thing that we've talked about a little bit. Uh, when we kind of switched to current events, uh, originally it was to talk about COVID, right? And to really dive into the beginning of this pandemic. And what we tried to emphasize way back then was that this was something that was going to last a while, was a huge structural problem within capitalism and where things aren't just going to go back to normal. And I think that for many of us right now, that's becoming more clear than ever. Uh, the United States has surpassed 250,000 deaths, um, which is just an absolutely horrifying number to think about. Um, the We're now finding out that even a lot of the bodies in New York that were stored in those freezer trucks from the big wave in spring are still in those trucks. So our infrastructure is still struggling to handle this. Hospitals are filling back up all over the country again. Several states are already basically at capacity and the holiday season is here and people are traveling unfortunately um you know planes have the airline business has not shut down commercial flights people are moving around the country so all you know if all of our models about how pandemics function uh are correct things are probably going to surge again, uh, which puts us in a really shitty situation. So the virus is still raging on and there's a couple of things that I think we should think about in the context of that. 
So one is what the Biden administration's plans to deal with that are and why they are clearly not enough. And the other is the question of the vaccine, right? Like uh, now we're getting closer with the Pfizer vaccine and an AstraZeneca vaccine uh, that the data looks pretty okay on. So what does that mean? You know, uh, there was an article getting shared around Facebook that was saying like, oh, the end is finally in sight. And I think that's really wrong. <laughs> so we can maybe get into what our prospects look like. Um I want to touch on the Biden administration, at least briefly, and sort of what their plan is. So obviously, one of the big liberal talking points around Biden has been that we'll have a responsible leader who can get us back tra- back on track with the pandemic, since Trump's actions have been admittedly essentially murderous in the level of irresponsibility that they represent. Um, so the question then is, does Biden have a plan that can actually resolve this pandemic? And the answer when you look at Biden's plan is a resounding fucking no, unfortunately. Um, you know, there are several fronts to what it would take to res- uh, resolve this pandemic. There is the sort of public health front, but there's also the economic front, right? And if we think there, uh, Biden is already failing. So one thing that you mentioned, Brett, right, is that if the Senate does not go to the Democrats, the ability to get a stimulus passed uh, really significantly drops. But on top of that, we're getting reports from insiders that Biden is privately pushing to make the stimulus package even smaller. So already one of the first things that we're seeing from him as he's getting Uh, ready to come into power is pushing for less assistance to people who need the assistance in order to be able to survive. There is no way to stop this pandemic so long as people are forced to continue to work in dangerous situations. And absent a giant stimulus that continually injects money directly to people, not just to small businesses or companies, then one of the key vectors for the virus to continue to spread is going to be there. And Biden is moving towards an even smaller stimulus package. So that doesn't necessarily bode well. Uh, Biden's plan includes national testing and contact tracing and a national mask mandate, but it really falls short on every single one of those. So one of the big things that Biden's touted is basically making a federal workforce to do testing and contact tracing. But when you look into the plan and the number of people he hopes to hire, it is only 100,000 people. Uh, and quite simply put, adding 100,000 jobs to the economy is not going to fix the massive unemployment problems that we're having as more and more businesses continue to close with the pandemic. And in addition to this, the mask mandate, which would be a helpful public health act, looks like it's not going to have any enforcement to it, making it functionally just another symbolic act by the Democrats that gestures in a progressive direction while doing really nothing. Mm -hmm. So long as essential workers are forced to go to work and put themselves on the line, uh, so long as, you know, the stress of isolation and, like, the real concrete risk of financial ruin drives people to not take lockdown seriously because they're kind of facing imminent demise anyway, and so long as economic and racial disparities make locking down viable only for those whose jobs allow it, largely white middle class people, this virus is going to continue, and Biden doesn't have a plan to address those systems problems. His only approach to approaching the racial disparities in relation to the virus is to make a recommendation-based task force on the federal level to look at race and the coronavirus, as if these recommendation-based task force actually accomplish anything. There are no concrete plans to deal with the systemic issues here. And it's not just that his plan is insufficient. At its very core, it is built on a neoliberal ideology and view of the world that is incapable of wrestling with the collective nature of a pandemic. Uh, Truthout wrote a really good article kind of looking at how the framing of his plan from the first place is already flawed. And I'll just quote what they say on this. So they say, quote, the Biden COVID plan speaks of families, small businesses, and first responders, but not communities. The gap embodies a classical liberalism, the dramatist personae cited representing, respectively, the means of reproducing workers, petite capital, and the state's capacity for biopolitical intervention. Pathogens spreading far and wide rarely respect such utilitarian demographics, end quote. And so, you know, we have, we are going to have this new president, one that people on the left even claimed was a tactical victory in some way, citing this virus. But I think If we are being honest with ourselves and looking at the plan put forth, there's not going to be much of a huge difference in terms of how this is going. This virus is going to continue to rage on, and yes, 
the middle class and the rich will probably have an easier time dodging the effects of it under Biden. But for the poor, and especially for those who are both racially and economically marginalized, this is not really going to change anything. The system is still just fundamentally flawed and broken. Yeah, and, and once again, this really highlights the just just the hollowness of, of Democratic Party politics. There is a once-in-a-lifetime crisis which opens up real opportunities for real change, right? We saw with, with FDR was able to get across the New Deal precisely because he came to power in a time of incredible suffering and incredible crises. And as terrible as they are, they open up opportunities to restructure your economy, your political system to help people and to really make a progressive leap forward in how you, how you do things, right? At least offers that opportunity. But what do we see with the Democratic Party and Biden? We see them on front after front after front failing to rise to the challenge of this crisis. You know, I, I heard before the election, liberals and even Biden himself, I think, making references to FDR as if this is an opportunity where Biden, who, you know, doesn't really have a, a hardcore ideology except for neoliberalism, but, you know, he could change and he could catch up with the time and people talking about, well, Biden, you know, one of his advantages, he's always sought to find the center of the party. And when that moves, he moves with it. He's open to it. And then right away when he wins and gets and starts picking this cabinet, putting forward policies, we see it's not nothing even close to that. Um, it's going to be not only another failure like the Obama um, by, like the Obama years, but a failure which increases the very conditions and make them worse that gave us Trump in the first place. Um, it's just going to pr- continue to immiserate people and, and push another right-wing demagogue who is perhaps more competent down the road. And I guarantee we're going to start seeing that lineup come up over the next few years. Um, but with like the stimulus package and even with like Chuck Schumer, you know, um, the, the Democratic leader of the Senate came out after Biden won and, and advocated publicly for $50,000 taken out of every student loan. So no matter how much you have, um, the government would just forgive the first $50,000 uh, of that loan, which is not nothing. It's something, right? I mean, obviously, you want to see it go away for everybody and all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. But immediately, what do they start doing? With no pressure from the right, they start negotiating themselves downward to the point where a couple days later, Biden might be willing to do ten thousand dollars with certain caveats you know and shit like that so with no pressure from the right no 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 argument they have to rise to the senate still possibly falling into their hands they could put forward at least a bold vision that that activates people and makes them interested to to support this this uh this administration out of the gates at least they immediately amongst themselves start reducing it same thing with the stimulus you know the, all these candidates in the democratic party running on we really need a stimulus we need to help People And the moment they have the chance to do it, they immediately start talking themselves down. So you don't even need Republican obstructionism and obstinance to to make the Democrats fold. That is just a convenient scapegoat for what they already want to do, which is fold. And if if, if the, the Senate can go to the Republicans, just like they did under the Obama years... It will continue to be a thing where the Democrats do fucking nothing, solve none of our problems, and then say it's the Republicans' obstructionism that doesn't allow us to do it. When even in the in those moments where we see that there's no such obstructionism and there is a crisis, you could really do something big and most Americans would be able to swallow it because it's something that they understand is unprecedented. You're dealing with the crisis and there's just nowhere to be seen. And, and so, so here we are again, uh, again and again and again, we're led back to the same exact fucking spot. Um, and, and I think we're going to see just an Obama administration 2.0, more brutality on the, uh, on the imperialist scene, right? These little piecemeal, caveated, conditional help for some people at some times, a uh, structural failure to solve any of the big problems facing us, trying to fill that void with symbolism, representation, uh, empty Democratic Party politics, which does nothing but just points at signifiers and doesn't solve any of our problems. Mm-hmm. We're going to have that exact same shit, but in worse conditions which just lead to worse right wing people coming up in 2024. And that's where we're at. And that's, it's, it's, it's horrifying. It's scary. It's not surprising. Um, but, but that's sort of where we are. You know, I was thinking of what's the best and worst case scenarios for a Biden administration. Could he really rise to the, to the challenge, prove some of his left wing flank wrong and, and be a, a sort of, uh, FDR 2.0? No, we're getting an Obama 2.0 and, and, yeah. and, and, and we're expected to thank them for it. <laughs> 
Right. <laughs> the worst part. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I want to address a little bit is uh, the vaccine question, yeah. right, with COVID and, like, is this all coming to an end? Uh, and why, you know, I think that might not be the case. Um, so, you know, let, let's recognize this Pfizer vaccine looks really promising, actually. Um, the data on the Pfizer vaccine looks really good. And it does look like it's probably going to get the emergency use authorization that it needs in order to rush production. Uh, so is that going to be enough to, you know, I saw people saying, like, oh, we'll be through this by April uh, is the thing that I saw people saying. And the question is, that is that true? Uh, and I, I don't think it is. And I'm going to explain a few reasons why and why I think we need to think more systemically than like, oh, one vaccine is going to fix this. Um, so in terms of vaccination, yes, we probably will get that vaccine emergency use authorization and it probably will get rushed production. But mass distribution and mass production is a separate question, right? So we will probably immediately get that vaccine to uh, healthcare workers, which is good, obviously, and is urgent and important, but distributing it to the public is going to be very hard. One, because of the cost of production, but with the Pfizer vaccine in particular, one of the strange things about it is that it needs to be stored at a significantly colder temperature than the majority of vaccines, which is already causing problems in terms of figuring out how to distribute it. So in terms of how long it'll take to produce and distribute it to the population at large, we are not looking at something where this pandemic's over by April. We are looking at something months, months, months longer. And that is assuming that people get the vaccine. And this is the other concerning thing that we're looking at, is that according to polling on state and national national levels, a huge amount of the population doesn't trust a vaccine right now and doesn't want to get it. And what's sort of interesting to look at here is that this isn't just sort of the anti-vaxxer crowd who are opposed to it. There are people who are more on the liberal left who don't want the vaccine because they feel it was rushed by the Trump campaign, or by the Trump presidency, and they doubt the safety of it. Uh, one poll that I was looking at in New York was saying as much as 25% of people say they would refuse it. And if we're looking at that kind of number of refusing the vaccine, the effectiveness of it is going to be extremely limited, meaning that the danger of COVID could still exist for high-risk people in the long term. So whether or not the vaccine is going to lead to that problem being solved quickly, I think is up in the air, but probably not. We are going to be looking at COVID for a longer than just a few months into next year, most likely. But the other thing that we need to think about is what caused COVID and where COVID came from and why COVID became a crisis on a global scale in the first place. And the thing that I've tried to emphasize over and over again is that there's going to be more of these viruses, right? We don't know the exact origin of COVID. That's something that's being highly debated. We know the DNAs that are involved in it, though. We know that it involves the interaction of animals that probably would not normally have interacted. And there, there's a couple of reasons for this, right? We know that a global system of trade that demands profit above all else is kind of what governs our world. And we also know that this is combined with a very ecologically destructive agribusiness practice of factory farming. And along with that, we also know that this is often paired with deforestation, which leads to animal populations increasingly coming in contact with them and vectors trading diseases between each other. Each other, which can lead to new diseases emerge as different forms of DNA are mixed together, which seems to be potentially what has happened with several of the last uh, pandemics with SARS-like respiratory viruses. So as long as that system exists, new diseases are going to continue to happen. And as long as capitalism exists and creates an international profit motive for the market to function that way, we are going to be stuck in that situation. But the other thing is, as long as those diseases keep popping up and capitalism still exists, they'll continue to pose a global threat, because profits always matter more than human lives. Look right now at this exact moment that we are in the middle of another surge with people dying rapidly, and the fact that neither the government nor private business has chosen to shut down airline flights for the holidays, right? Because making money off of people during Thanksgiving is more important than preventing massive global deaths. And so there is simply no way built into a market capitalist system to check back for things like this. So even if COVID is is over by April, even if we find ourselves in a situation where things go back to normal, whatever that means, that's not going to last as long as ecological destruction, factory farming, and capitalist profit motives continue to destroy our planet and lead to irresponsible forms of global capitalist exchange that just don't care about human life. 
So regardless of where things are going with this in particular, it's important that we keep our eyes on the fact that capitalism is the problem. Imperialism and global market exchanges that only care about benefiting rich nations and shareholders are the problem that made COVID happen. And there will be more COVIDs unless something is done about that. So the prize isn't something that can be resolved by electing new presidents or by getting through a new vaccine. It can only be resolved through the destruction of the imperialist order. It's a uh, tall order but that's what it's going to take for us to get past this absolutely yeah i mean i i I second all of that and you know just talking about the sort of conspiratorial thinking in our society and like the anti-vaccine stuff we've always had a a resurgence of that and it sort of unlike some other conspiracy theories vaccines are one of the one of the conspiracy theories that go across the political spectrum for different reasons on the left i think you, you do have this sense of like suspicion of corporations and big pharma, which can lead to left-wing versions of vaccine uh, conspiracy theories. And you have some like center, center right, center left conspiracy thinkings about like Bill Gates and the, and the global elite and the Illuminati and being microchipped. And then you just have on the, on the far right, just a disdain of any expertise, anti-scientific thinking, anti-intellectualism, anti all of that stuff, which, which feeds into it from that end. Like I even today on, on Instagram, I saw immortal technique post something where he's suspicious of these vaccines or whatever, you know, whatever you think about a mortal technique, the fact is he's <laughs> on the left and, and giving credence to these things. On sure. the other hand, we can't totally dismiss this stuff either. It's not like every single vaccine has been um, 100% safe. And particularly when it's rushed so quickly, it's really just honestly hard to say. Um, in, in Pakistan, we were talking about this on Guerrilla History. Um, in Pakistan, it, was, it came out that a few years ago when they were searching for Osama bin Laden, one of the things the CIA did was set up, I think it was um, a fake polio vaccination uh, thing, right? And what they were really doing was extracting genetic data from the people hoping to find a close relative of bin Laden to then follow and see if they can they can get him, right? And when this story came out, not only did it did it provide a lot of energy to the, the insurgency and, 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 you know, counter-American forces or even Islamic extremist forces, it made the regular every day people suspicious of vaccines and there's there's cases throughout history where this has been the case and so it's not like these things come with absolutely no risks right we don't want to fall into the uh the the, the error of saying you know these are always 100 percent fine and there's you know these these huge corporations pursuing profit are, are going to do everything in our best interest of course not but you know that's why understanding the science of it is really crucial and you know when you understand the science of it you can examine it on a scientific basis you don't have to trust corporations Operations. You can trust medical experts, and that will give you a much better sort of um, compass through which to to orient yourself t- to these things. But yeah, I think it's going to be a huge problem. And then we already see what happens on um, social media, right? Where social media right. now is just this machine of conspiracy theories. From YouTube to Facebook, these algorithms promote the worst elements in our society. So you know, even like regular wine moms in the suburbs started falling into QAnon conspiracy theories through like shit like Wayfair and Save Our Children, you know, these conspiracies playing on people's good hearts and not wanting kids to be hurt, you know, but then before you know it, they're off in La La Land waiting for the next cue drop. Um, so, so social media is really going to just aggravate every problem we have in our society, including this one. And I think, uh, you know, it's important to think of people like Zuckerberg, um, not as like this sort of clueless guy trying to do his best to find the middle ground and navigate government and provide a service to people, but somebody that actively and consciously profits off of the the proliferation of conspiracy thinking and right wing propaganda. Like he literally profits off it. He knows he profits off it. He refuses to take huge actions to prevent it because it cuts into his profits. So Zuckerberg and people like him on these big social media platforms are the worst side of, of capitalism and they're not naive about it. They know what they're profiting off of. They know that, that put pumping hours of conspiracy theories into the minds of utterly confused Americans keeps them on their platforms longer and rakes in the dollars. And so, you know, these, these people should be called out and pointed to as, as what they are. Um, and then we've always had, as I've said before, you know, this, there's a book by Hofstadter, The Paranoid Style in American Politics. We've had the John Birch Society. We've had right wing conspiracy thinking all throughout, um, American history. It's just now being heightened because the way that the U.S. presents itself, the, the stories it tells about itself is getting further and further away from any realistic sort of, you know, Venn diagram where it overlaps with how things actually are, right? And so when 
this sort of the appearance of things and the reality of things stretch apart, um, people will continue to fall into the middle, which is conspiratorial thinking to try to bridge those gaps of cognitive dissidence uh, in, in their own minds. I think we see a lot of that on the right. Like after Trump, you know, became clear and clear that Trump has lost the election and that these were hopeless attempts to, to overturn it. There was a sort of crisis of faith in certain QAnon forums. Like, you know, how could this happen? This isn't what was supposed to happen. Trump was absolutely supposed to win so he can continue trying to overthrow the cannibalistic pedophile ring that the Democrats are leading, right? So, like, th- like in a lot of ways, it's like you can hate these people and you can call them stupid. But there's a lot of like just naive, ignorant people, right? They're not taught about history, American politics. They're not given a great education. They're thrown out into a world. They become the victims of corporate and social media. And you start thinking of a lot of these people sometimes as psychological victims and not all just mm-hmm. dumb people that you can just dismiss as, as ho- hopeless, I think is something we also have to think about. And a lot of this shit's popping up in our families. We have parents or uncles or cousins who have fallen into this. I've had people in my family who fell for the Wayfair thing, right? And I was able to pull them out of that hole and show them that this is actually a lie and this is connected to QAnon. And so they stepped back from it immediately. But these things have a gravity to them. And as Americans who really think that America is the best, that we're number one, uh, not even in a chauvinistic way, but just in like a parroting what you've always heard your whole life way, to see the, the depravity of America up close and personal and to see everything they believe about America fall apart in front of their eyes, it's a psychologically jarring experience yeah. for millions of Americans. And we should at least think how we can navigate that. There's no easy answers there, but yeah, just something that I think about a lot when it comes to this stuff. Yeah, but the conspiracy theories especially, I think, like, focusing on that psychological victimhood can be interesting. One of, like, the ways of framing it that I think has helped me understand QAnon, at least, has been people pushing for thinking about QAnon as a cult, right? Like, it really has kind of a religious um sort of function. If you think about formally, like, what religions have to them, QAnon has uh sort of like an eschatology, right? So an idea about what the end of the world will look like in this coming moment of salvation, you know, so they refer to it as the storm often when uh, horrifically enough essentially Trump would arrest all of his enemies and execute his political enemies yeah. um, in the streets, which, you know, again, to be in a situation where that looks like salvation to you, something has already gone deeply wrong. Um, but, you know, it, it has sort of this religious fervor to it, and it really feels almost like a religious uh, revivalism sort of vibe to it. And so people, you know, turning to that in the face of despair and in the face of difficulty shouldn't surprise us, right? You know, this is already fairly similar to the writings that Marx has on religion, right? Uh, We've talked before about how the misinterpretation of what the opiates of the masses means, right? It's Mm -hmm. not that religion makes you dumb and subdued, as many people uh, sort of bastardize that excerpt, but that religion is a pain reliever in times of great crisis that people turn to because they can't... um, we don't even they can't. They're not necessarily given the tools that they need to reconcile with what's happening in the world around them or to understand how to fight back against terrible conditions. And so I think part of the role that conspiracy theories are playing in contemporary American culture is similar to that kind of view of religion as a reactionary force. And it's very unfortunate. And yeah, I think the thing that I've really seen, like you hinted at, Brett, is like it's hitting everyone, right? Like everyone I know has a family member who uh, has has at least dabbled with this stuff and families are being destroyed actually and torn apart over this and a lot of these people are finding themselves isolated from their loved ones because they've become insufferable and uh you know lost touch with reality over this and it's destroyed relationships so there's something really devastating about what's going on with these conspiracy theories as well that i think requires us to think beyond oh these people are dumb um and to really think about the social function that they're playing here and the ideological function that they're playing as well and it doesn't make them any less frustrating um but it maybe makes them scarier and more insidious perhaps yeah yeah and just to just to sort of highlight your point about this sort of religious fervor and the religious dynamics of conspiratorial thinking particularly QAnon, you have elements of the rapture right the storm Mm -hmm. you have elements of a messianic figure trump was sent to protect us and and solve this problem you even have like anti-semitic blood libel conspiracy theorizing which gets sort of wrapped up and, and obscured a little bit, but it's like democratic elites are literally using the blood of children. You know, um, uh, an old Jewish man by the name of George Soros is funding everything I don't like in society. All of these things sort of sort of dovetail, and it's this religious bigotry with this religious rapturism and messianic figurism, and it's a bunch of different stuff. And you know, 
I, this is something I kind of wanted to touch on and we're, we are touching on it already, but trying to explain conspiracy theories broadly, you know, everybody has some explanation, but I find any one explanation sort of reductionist. Like th there's like different elements to it. There's the psychological element. There is the political element. There's certainly something about an, an a hegemonic empire in decay that will give rise to a certain subsect of that population just going full Looney Tunes with their understanding of the world. World. Uh, there's political, there's economic reasons, right? But it can't be reduced to any singular reason. And so, right. you know, obviously calling every, all these people just dumb is like the laziest way you could do this. But I think it does point at this urge to reduce these explanations for why people think of these things to one neat, nice little box that makes us feel not only correct and and maybe there's a way out but also superior to the people that we're talking about i think that's ultimately unhelpful like like you know like i said it's psychological it's political it's economic mm -hmm. it's it's global hegemon in in decay it's it's the cognitive dissidence no longer being able to be glued together through ideology right it's all of these things and more and so i just just to just to problematize those explanations and just to to, to not fall into the trap of being overly reductionist and thinking that you you understand what's going on it's deeper than that Right. No, exactly. And, I, you know, the other thing you mentioned, the empire and decay, and this is where we have sort of historical precedent for thinking about this, right? Where uh, it's one of those weird things where there are parallels to the situation in Russia during the revolutionary era in as much as a lot of contemporary anti-Semitic conspiracy theories are based on that document, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, right? Which is this document that uh, pretends to be uh, the meeting notes of a group of Jewish elites playing how they're going to destroy Western civilization and control the world. Um, a lot of right-wing conspiracy theories, even when they are not explicitly anti-Semitic, are just repeating tropes from this, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you listen to when people talk about globalists, it's the same tropes. Uh, but the context in which that document first emerged was that it was distributed by loyalists to the Tsar, right? And there is sufficient evidence that the Tsarist regime promoted its distribution, because in times of imperial decay, conspiracies like that are useful for those in power. And so that is sort of an economic function during political and economic crisis that these conspiracies play that I think is important to think about. You know, there is an intentional manipulation that can be done by those in power to push these forms of conspiracies. And in the context of the United States, uh, you hinted at this somewhat as well. There's the simple fact that, like, we know for a fact that our government has done some fucked up shit. <laughs> and once you know about that sort of stuff, it is easy to think about conspiracies being possibly true, right? The things that we now know about COINTELPRO and counterintelligence on the whole, or even the declassified parts of MK Ultra that we know are fact, um, sound like conspiracy theories, right? <laughs> when you hear them. And the intelligence agencies in this country have done such horrific, monstrous actions, both domestically and abroad, that it's not hard for a populace who knows about those to be like, well, maybe this other stuff is true too, right? Because <laughs> the level of evil and violence that we know for fact has happened is so high to begin with. So I think that in the context of the U.S., right, the just clear evils that this country has committed make it easier to believe those conspiracy theories in some way as well. Yeah, absolutely. And popular culture plays into it, like History Channel, Ancient Aliens, Bigfoot, like, you know, millions of Americans are really just hit with this stuff all the time in a million different ways. And of course, it starts to take an effect. What fascism does, whether it's explicit or implicit, whether it's just growing or in full bloom, you know, at the end of the day, that one of the main primary functions of any sort of fascism, which is always tied to conspiracy thinking, is to shift your eyes away from the real causes of your problems, right? It's not capitalism. It's it's not class structure. It's not imperialism. It's not settler colonialism. It's blah, 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 fill in the blank. The immigrant, right. the black person, these, these democratic pedophile cannibals, whatever it is, um, that, that's what, that, that serves that function ultimately. And this is why the ruling elite of capitalist societies have always gone with fascist currents in their societies, always against the left and always in an attempt to scapegoat something other than the system that's causing these, these miseries in the first place. And conspiracy theories fill that function. They, they serve to, to fill that, um, that that interest and uh 
So there's really no huge incentive to get rid of it, right? If you're a corporation, you're social media, you make money off it. If you're some stupid ass channel that people watch where you're talking about ancient aliens all day, you make money off it. If you're a Republican elite, keeping your base continually confused about the cause of their problems can only serve your power and your interest. There is no incentive for any of these people or institutions to actually have an educated, well-informed, sober-minded, critical thinking population. Yeah. And uh, we're living with the, with the runes of that right now yeah it's a bummer <laughs> yeah <laughs> so thank you all so much for listening uh this is our second back-to-back that we've done for current events so we'll be getting back to theory we haven't picked a singular text or section of a text yet but we are definitely going to be turning towards looking at the political economy side of marx um we've talked a little bit about how we feel like we've neglected that side of marx now uh, i know that'll be a challenge for me as someone whose background is in philosophy uh not economics or political science but i think that'll be an interesting direction for us to move in so we'll let you know exactly what we'll be reading over social media i know people like to read ahead before we do our episodes sometimes and we always appreciate it if people do so that's something that we will definitely give you some information on going forward and thank you for checking in like i said you can find us on patreon at patreon.com slash the red menace and on twitter at uh red underscore menace underscore pod uh you can always get more information there thank you so much for all of your ongoing and continuing support it means a lot to us as the world continues to spiral out of control and we will be with you next month to discuss some theory I hope you all are doing well in solidarity.